Well, uh, I would say good morning, but it's not morning. Welcome to Money Matters Facebook Live, noon on Wednesdays. Uh, I am live, and I am uh, happy to be here. I don't know about this sun. Let's see if that works. So uh, again, uh, hi, I'm Wes Moss, host of Money Matters. I would say every Sunday morning, but today and every Wednesday, we do and answer questions on what we call Money Matters Facebook Live. So no matter where I am in the world, and today I'm not in my office, I'm in another office, actually at a real estate closing, and here to answer questions for uh, listeners to our Sunday show, Money Matters. So good morning, or good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in to Facebook Live. So I have a couple questions here that we've gotten recently, and I'm just gonna go uh, through Facebook, and I'm gonna go through those questions. They're similar to some of the questions that we get on air, so I know people are, are wondering about this stuff and worried about this stuff. So let me, let, me, let me look at this first one and read this for folks. So this one is from Carol. I'm just gonna say Carol, and by the way, if you're listening to Facebook Live and you have financial questions that you'd like me to answer next Wednesday at noon, then please email them to us or text them in the comment section right here as we do this, and we'll get to them next week. You can always email me as well, just through my website, westmoss.com, email section, upper right-hand corner. So this first question is coming from Carol. Wes, do you recommend a home equity line of credit when you already have a mortgage? So home equity line of credit, and I have a mortgage. Well, we have, this is Carol, we have $130,000 remaining to pay off our mortgage. My husband is currently putting everything on a credit card at a high interest rate. He says he needs about $50,000 to pay off twenty grand in credit card debt and we will keep the rest for emergencies. So I guess keep the other thirty. Our house is about 11 years old. We'll need to replace air conditioners, which will cost at least $10,000, washer, dryer, etc. I say we downsize. He doesn't. What do you think? All right. Anything that is home equity line related that is there to pay off credit card, remember, it, it, first of all, financially, it, it, it makes sense, right? I mean, if you have a credit card that is 20% a year in interest payments, which is egregious, and uh, it, it, it's, it's almost in, in, in a tool of imprisonment. It's a, it's a financial tool of imprisonment is what these credit cards are. So if you can get a, a credit line from your house for... 4% or 5%, then I think financially, obviously, it makes sense. The problem with that is that it sounds a lot like 2004 and five and six. Remember what happened then? HELOCs, everyone's house had appreciated. He, everyone was offered a HELOC. Hey, you can always take money out of your house. So Americans overspent, and they overspent so badly that it ultimately led to this implosion of economics in America, housing prices dropped, people went and for millions of foreclosures, and people were left holding the bag because the asset that they borrowed money on, which was their, uh, which was their home, they used an equity line for it, and they ended up effectively going bust. And that's the same thing that worries me in a question like this. Hey, we're over, what, what she's saying, Car what Carol's saying here, and hopefully Carol, you're listening, what you're saying here is that you guys are just overspending and and sounds like by a lot and you now one thing that I can tell from this is that you are if you only owe $130,000 on your house it doesn't seem like you went out and bought some mega mansion somewhere so it doesn't seem as though you guys are egregiously overspending and I would say this financially the numbers certainly work that a HELOC should cost you far less than a credit card. So on the surface, it makes sense. The, the problem here is the philosophy is philosophical. It's like, why are you really doing it? Well, it's, you're doing it because you're overspending. I would say, yes, go ahead and do it. Take out the, uh, just enough to pay off the debt. Don't take another 30,000 out because then you're just continuing to borrow from the equity of your home. And if you really have an emergency, you can always go back to the credit card, but the whole purpose of doing this is a one-time event. Hey, do it one time, get rid of the debt, and don't make it a slippery slope. So don't borrow 20 and then pull out another 30 so you can have some cash to go buy, be tempted to buy something material that you don't need. The problem here is 
is effectively living beyond your means. And that is an issue. And you cannot use your, the equity in your house to fix that. You can, but philosophically, it's a slippery slope and it leads to bad decisions. So I would say if you're going to do the home equity line, don't get 50 out. Get 20 out. Get rid of the debt. And then only... And then try not to tap the credit cards again. So that that's my thought on this is that use it only for the debt, not the other thirty thousand dollars. Fifty is way too much to pull out of the house. So that's that. Carol, good luck, and thank you so much for asking the question. I'm happy to, to happy to help and, and help you through these. Next one is from Dorothy. So here's what Dorothy says. Wes, I'm 60. My husband, who is also 60. Plans to work until he's 66. So they've got a, we've got a few. Dorothy and her husband have a few more years to go before they stop working. He brings home $2,800 a month after 2,800 per month after all deductions. He carries health insurance, but would have to add dental and vision after I retire. Which this is Dorothy retiring. We do not fund our own our son's college, but we help with expenses occasionally. I plan on finding a part-time job close to home, but my skills are limited as I have spent the last past 40 years in nursing and do not want anything in the medical field. Is it too start is it too early to start withdrawing from our investments? Man, Dorothy, first of all, if you've been 40 years as a nurse, what do you mean you don't have any skills? That's silly. Uh, you, you have skills as a nurse, for God's sakes. Now, if you don't want to be a nurse, I get it. My wife was a nurse, and it, once a nurse, always a nurse, and ha, what for over 10 years. The, and what happened is that we had a bunch of kids. So after our second child, she got her master's in nursing psychiatry and then effectively left the profession to take care of the kids. And now we have four kids. So she's, let's put it this way, she's not going back to nursing anytime soon. But, Dorothy, you don't want to be a nurse. My thought is that, yeah, at 60, unless you have the tremendous amount of retirement savings, it's pretty early to start doing this. If you haven't planned for this, and if your husband's working until 66, then what are you going to do? You guys are the same age. Are you going to not work for six years while he continues to work? If you've got lots of stuff to do and you've got a million hobbies and core pursuits, like I talk about in the book, you can retire sooner than you think, then sure, go ahead and do it. But... I, just because you're burned out of nursing doesn't mean you can't still get a job that is somewhat nursing related. I, we've got a, a very good friend of my wife, a nurse that she met while she was at Children's Healthcare uh, of Atlanta and, at Eggleston, who is now a medical, works for attorneys in medical malpractice suits. So she either defends or, I don't know if she def, you, does defense work or in the, on the prosecution side, but because she was a nurse and she understands the hospital, she's able to go do this effectively administrative and research type work and gets paid a heck of a lot of money to do so working for all these attorneys. So there's a lot of other jobs that don't tell me because you're a nurse you have no other skills. That's silly. You got tons of skills. You may not have thought about some of these other areas of the nursing field. So my opinion is that, and I don't have all your financials here, Dorothy, uh, but I think it's a little early. What are you gonna do for six years before your husband retires? I would find something, sounds like your career burnout, and I get that, and I see that all the time. You've got to, especially if you didn't do something for something for 40 straight years, change it up. Use your nursing for something else besides nursing in a hospital. And I know that you can find that, but put your mind to do so. So that's my, my call on Dorothy. The, and we'll get to some of these withdrawal questions on how much could you really withdraw because here, here, here this question comes from James. And we've got a lot of folks tuning in now. Hi, welcome to Money Matters Live. Wes Moss here. Uh, Wednesdays at noon as we answer your financial questions. If you have questions you want me to get to next week or even Sunday on the radio show on WSB Radio, AM 750 and 95.5 FM, Sundays from 9 to 11, email me. Go to westmoss.com, send me the emails. I'll try to answer those questions live on the show radio or right here Facebook Live. Now, next question. James asks, hey, Wes, my parents are within a year or two of retiring. I feel like we should have some music queued up for this. One parent is stressed about retirement finances. The other may be too overconfident about what their retirement income sources may provide. I think that a retirement budget would be great for both of them. What would you recommend? I recommend, Jerry, 
or I'm sorry, this is from James. James, thank you for the question. I recommend that your, your parents figure out what their budget should be from their finances as opposed to what their budget, what they would like it to be and then have their finances to fit. It's easier to figure out what your finances uh, are going to provide for you as opposed to trying to figure out a budget and then back work out, uh, have a workaround to have your finances fit that. It's a lot easier to just control your spending from what you know is going to come in. So if, if your parents have Social Security, which let's say mom and dad have Social Security, and maybe a pension. That's a pretty common scenario I see. And let's say that adds up to $5,000. Then they have another $500,000 that should produce approximately another $2,000 a month. That's $7,000. They need to learn to live on the seven. Then, the, by the way, that's seven pre-tax, the seven post-tax. Remember, we've got to net this down to taxes. Good news is in retirement, a lot of our taxes go down, especially if we're in the state of Georgia, where our state tax, there's a huge state, Georgia state tax exemption that goes into effect. So you keep more of what you have or what you earn. But he, this comes back to this, this when I retire, what my rate, rate of withdrawal is. There's this giant debate that'll, that'll probably last forever on how much you're allowed to withdraw or supposed to be able to withdraw for the duration of your retirement career. So you retire at 65 and you've got, this money is the last 30 years. Well, historically, the number that's agreed upon in the financial community is 4.1, 4.2%. That's an agreed upon number plus inflation. I go back to, I call the thousand bucks a month rule as a way to think about what how much money your retirement savings should be producing for you. So for every $240,000, you should be able to generate about 1000 bucks a month on average over time. That equals 240 times 5% is 12000 divided by 12 months, 1000 bucks a month. The, the problem with that is that 5% as a withdrawal rate is too much if you, get, if you retire super, super early. So if you're a 55-year-old retiree, 5% is way too much to start withdrawing from your assets. Even if you're in your early 60s, 5% is, in my opinion, a little bit too much. 5% can be an average over your 30-year retirement lifespan, but to start out at 5% is a little bit too early, uh, Jer or James, for your, for your parents. So my thought here would be to start out in the, in the 3 and a half to 4% range if they're in their early 60s. And then understand what that will add using a, a conservative 4% number, add that to Social Security and the pension that they might have, and then they've got to make their budget, they've got to make their budget uh, work within that context. They can't invent a budget and then try to back in what their finances will do for them. The, 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 the immovable factors here are social, social, pension, and then that 4% number. Don't push that number too high because it can lead to trouble. Trouble. All right, we've got an investment-oriented question next, and then we'll wrap this up for today. Uh, by the way, good afternoon. Uh, you're listening to Money Matters Live. I'm Wes Moss, host of Money Matters on WSB Radio here in Atlanta. And every Wednesday, we do a Facebook Live to answer, to answer additional questions. This next one, hey, Wes, in your podcast, I hear that you use the term POF, proof of default, which, by the way, I've never used that term. I don't know what you're hearing, but I've never used proof of default. Um, and you mentioned there were 24 companies that had lower proof of default insurance costs than the U.S. government. I have researched this term on the internet and cannot find anything. Is this your term only, and what are the 24 companies? I have a feeling the reason they're not finding the POF, because I don't know if I've ever used that term POF. What they may be, what you may be hearing on this is credit default, not proof of default. So CDS or credit default swaps are financial vehicles. And the, the sun is so bright here, isn't it? I don't know what I can do about that. Is there a way that Facebook Live allows you to... I can't... There's nothing I can do. Sorry about the super brightness in this room, by the way. Let me see if that works. And that works. It doesn't do anything like a photo. Anyway, uh, these credit default swaps are measures of insurance and they're measures on how much it costs to insure the debt of a company if it goes bust. 
So if I buy, and, and, and they don't cost a huge amount relative to how large these insurance contracts really are, but let's say your company, your hedge fund, and you own a ton of bonds from an insurance company. And you say, well, I've got all these bonds, but what happens if they go bust? Well, they can buy insurance, and if the bonds go bust, the hedge fund or the investment company can get paid. Effectively, just the same thing as if I have insurance on my house and it burns down, uh, AIG or Chubb or whoever it might be, they're going to pay me to be able to rebuild the house. Same thing on these credit default swaps. So they're, they are insurance contracts that kick in if the company goes bust and can't pay on their debt. So clearly, the safer the house and the less risk of it is in a flood plane, the cheaper the, the life, the um, insurance or property insurance, of course. Same thing with these, these credit default swaps or these com companies that are really, really financially strong will have lower credit default swap prices or credit pricing, if you will, because the chances of the going bust are extremely, extremely low. So, the, the, there is a measure to some extent, and when a company starts to run into financial trouble, if you look at these CDS, CDS credit default swap, these, the pricing, you'll see as banks get in trouble or companies get in trouble, the price to insure their debt goes up and up and up and up and up, like a risky driver. The more accidents you have, the more your car insurance is. Or the worse your credit is, the higher you pay in interest. Well. That's the same thing in the marketplace. So there's a very interesting phenomenon that I've tracked for many years. I talked about this recently on Money Matters is that there are a couple of dozen companies that have about the same amount or even lower cost to insure their debt than the U.S. Treasury bond. And remember that that is supposed to be the gold standard of the world, meaning that, hey, credit, U.S. government treasuries should have zero risk whatsoever. And what, we, what we've seen now in the last since the financial crisis, there are companies out there, publicly traded companies that have a lower perceived risk by the market that they'll ever go out of business. In fact, the, the pricing to insure their debt in many cases is lower than it costs to insure U.S. government treasury debt, which is just a, which is a wild phenomenon to me. But it's, it's the truth. So it's, in my opinion, it is a true measure of the financial stability or quality of some of these companies. So I'm going to go over some of these names here. Uh, and this, is, this goes to, these are companies that have a, about the same cost to insure their debt as the U.S. government. And some of these are even lower cost to insure their debt. Uh, it, let me go th through some of these. One that you might want to get, you, I would guess right out of the gate, Procter & Gamble and Disney, both uh, a, a similar to lower cost to insure those bonds than the U.S. government. Raytheon, the big U.S. defense contractor, lower cost to insure that debt than the U.S. government. United Parcel Service, UPS, right here in Atlanta. Another defense company, Northrop Grumman, another defense company with really inexpensive cost to insure their debt. Bristol Myers, Merck is another company. So a couple big healthcare companies that are on this list. And it's a very, very long list, and I'm not going to go over all of it, but this is an interesting place to start. In fact, there's some technology companies on this list. Google and Cisco are both on the list as companies that have a lower cost to insure their debt from going bust than the U than U.S. government debt. What that tells us as investors, or tells me, is that these are pretty safe companies and I don't have to worry, I don't have to worry about their debt going bust. So if I own these bonds, I don't have to worry or be up at night worried that these companies aren't gonna make good on that promise, meaning that I'm gonna get my interest and at the end of the term of the bond, I'll get my money back. And that's the way I perceive this measure of financial stability and really credit for big U.S. companies. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that these companies are amazing stocks. It doesn't necessarily, remember, financial stability doesn't always translate to great companies to invest in stock-wise, but it's a pretty darn good place to start. So that's one of the lists that I look at when I'm buying companies uh, for myself, our family, and for clients that we work with. And these are some of the companies that we'll talk about on Money matters. So with that, we've had a long Facebook Live here. Please share this with your friends. 
and those folks that are fans of Money Matters that like money-related stuff. This is just a live, raw, uh, unedited version of me answering questions, which is really what a lot of Sunday mornings on WSB Radio is as well. So please share with your friends, and if you haven't already liked the Facebook page, West Moss Money Matters, please do so. Again, if you have more questions and you would like to just email them directly to me and my team, of course, you could comment on Facebook or go right to westmoss.com, the website wesmoss.com. There's a contact tab at the upper left-hand side and the upper right-hand side. Those contact forms come straight to me and our team and we will do our very best to either email you directly or answer some of these questions in a lot in this live format online next time we'll try to do something about the lighting because i know it seems awfully bright in this room even though it's a kind of a dark room but i'm still learning how to figure out the the cameras here on iphone so thanks so much for tuning in have a wonderful rest of the day